recording. Admit. Good morning, everybody. So last month, after a few glitches, I didn't get to do my um, fact. So I've carried it forward. So this morning's fact should have been in April, and it's about premium bonds, which I thought was quite good because you start the new financial year in April. Anyway, premium bonds. A post office savings account was introduced in 1861 after a Huddersfield banker, Charles Sykes, suggested it to the then treasurer Gladstone, who wanted to provide a savings account within an hour's walk of a working man's fireplace. During the First World War, the government needed to borrow money and so introduced war savings certificates. In 1916, in 1917, these were changed to national war bonds. These raised the equivalent of 24 billion pounds in today's money. During the Second World War, similar bonds were released and deposits rose from 509 million to 1,982 million between 1939 and 1946. After the war, the government wanted to encourage people to save again. And on the 1st of November, 1956, the premium bonds that we know now first went on sale. Today, you can win a million pounds twice a month and hold a maximum of 50,000 pounds in premium bonds. 82 billion bonds go into the draw every month and the odds of winning a 24,000 to one. More than 350,000 bonds from the original 1956 are still active today. And over 1.6 million prizes, totaling 63 million pounds has gone unclaimed. So if you've got premium bonds stashed in a drawer, I'd get them out and have a look, see if you've um, won anything. So, there. Right then, moving swiftly on, I'm going to go to Angela Bell this morning, who's Industry Outreach Lead for the Pensions Regulator. Angela has been recommended as a speaker by Kerry Whale, following a meeting she attended as a member of the HMRC Employer and Payroll Group, as she thought that the content she shared would be useful for IAB members, as well as general information on pension compliance. And I've lost you, Angela, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm still here. Ah, you're there, excellent. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much, Caroline. Um, I'm just going to do the inevitable sharing of screens. So let me yeah. just get everything in the right place here and make sure you can see. Yeah, got you. Right, wonderful. Um, let me just... Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so um, thank you very much for inviting me um, today. So I lead the industry engagement work stream, um, which is one of the four key work streams within the pensions dashboard project team at TPR. So those work streams, obviously there's industry engagement, there's also communications, there's policy and there's operational design. But the key thing um, is that all four of those work streams are 100% pensions dashboards focused. So we're sort of living, breathing it. 24-7. Um, We've spoken to IAB regularly in the past on automatic enrolment, where bookkeepers and accountants played a key role in its success. And today, I'm not going to talk about automatic enrolment, although there, there, there is some symmetry there, um, but I'm going to be talking about pensions dashboards and the role that you can play there both now and on an ongoing basis in, in terms of helping to ensure that the data that you provide from employers to pension providers is accurate and up to date. Um, so what am I going to cover? Let's just almost forgot about my slides. So there we go. OK, so I'm going to outline TPL's role and the challenges and opportunities that dashboards bring with them um, and give you a quick overview of how they, how they actually work. I'll then cover the current position in terms of consultations and regulations and who's doing what. And I'm also going to cover DWP's recent announcement about their intention to legislate to amend the existing staging timetable. Um, which is the date by which schemes need to connect to the dashboards. I'm going to cover the role that employers will play and then finish with our approach to compliance and enforcement before opening to your questions. And what I'd like you to take away from this is a better understanding of what pensions dashboards are looking to achieve um, and what the duties will involve for the pensions industry. So some of the challenges and, and opportunities, um, and I've, I've put these points in here um, so that you can maybe access these after. So there are some links in, in these slides as well. 
So automatic enrollment was a resounding success. You know, we've got more people saving in pensions now than ever before. Um, and combined with savers changing work patterns, I mean, we don't really have a job for life um, anymore. Most people end up with more than one pension and that can be difficult to track. We know that savers don't always tell administrators when their details change, for example, when they change their name or when they move home. And on the other hand, savers have got far more complex decisions to make at retirement now. And so pensions dashboards are going to allow millions of UK savers to access their pensions information all in one place and at the touch of a few buttons. Dashboards can help people reconnect with lost pensions and show all of that information in one place. And from there, they can seek advice and guidance and plan for retirement. I, I, I just wanted to draw your attention to a survey that the PPI, the Pensions Policy Institute, published last year, which really does show the scale of the problem of lost pension pots, which have increased by £7 billion in just four years. The total value of lost pension pots has grown by almost 40% from 19 billion in 2018 to over 26 billion in 2022. Um, and, you know, over 2.8 million pension pots are considered lost. That's an increase of 75% over the last four years. Now, the average value of those lost pots was a real eye opener for me because I was expecting that increase because of the increase in the number of people saving for their retirement through automatic enrolment. And I was expecting those lost pots to be worth pennies, hundreds of pounds, maybe an average of a thousand pound per lost pot, but actually it's a staggering nine and a half thousand pounds um, per, for an average lost pot, which is significant. Um, so industry and government, and obviously the regulators are all really supportive of dashboards for all of those reasons. And we've actually recognized dashboards as a key initiative in our corporate strategy and our corporate plan. So, how will they work? Now, I'm hoping you can see this table. There is actually a link here to a very useful three minute explainer video that the Pensions Dashboard Programme have put together, um, which is really useful. Uh, but I have had trouble playing that through virtual webinars previously. So uh, I've just put it there as a link and I'll, I'll just explain this. So this bit here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, the bit in the middle, um, is the, eco, the dashboard ecosystem. This is where all the plumbing happens, if you like. And this is run by the Pensions Dashboard Programme, which is part of the Money and Pension Service, part of MAPS and was set up by government. So this is the infrastructure that they're putting in place. So at the bottom here, you've got all the pension schemes. Now they will onboard with PDP to connect to dashboards and comply with their duties. And in many cases, schemes will use a third party or a bridge, if you like, to support their connection. They'll use a mix of, of third parties. They might use their third party administrator who's, who's setting up a connection point, or they may um, look to a new and emerging market, um, which has been developing over the past year or so, which are called integrated service providers and connect through them. So that's connecting to the system um, from a provider perspective. What's at the top here? So in terms of the consumer journey, um, the first thing that they will need to do is to authenticate themselves to prove they are who they say they are. You know, that's really important. Certain data will be gathered that can be verified, such as date of birth, surname, and also additional data that's self-asserted, such as address and, and, and mobile number. They're gonna need to give permission to enable a search of their pensions and to retrieve that data. And once that's done, the Pension Finder service will send out an instruction to all the data providers to search for relevant pensions. Where a match is found, that's then returned with a token to ensure secure access to allow the dashboard to access that data and display it to the user. That view data includes admin data, so where the information's from, the value data in general, that's the, that's the calculation taken from the last annual benefit statement, and also further information, contextual information and signposting. Now, if a pension scheme is not certain enough that they've made a match, it should return what's termed a possible match. Um, and in that case, the individual wouldn't receive personal data from the scheme, only, an, only a message and contact details for the scheme. That person needs to then contact the scheme, provide sufficient information for the scheme to be confident it's a match. 
So those partial matches are really important because they're a really good opportunity for schemes to update the data they hold that they might not otherwise have been able to, to do so. Um, and the regs give a 30 day turnaround to confirm the partial match. And where there's no match found, there's simply no return. And that's to avoid thousands and thousands of no return data having to be fed back through the system. On to my next slide. Okay, so there's lots of links here. I'm not gonna go through all of these publications, but you can see I've provided those links for future reference. Um, and you can also see the different delivery partners involved. So you've got DWP at the top there who are obviously making the regulations. Um, you've got PDP who are the, the organization doing the plumbing and uh, making sure that the central digital architecture, architecture, I can't say that word, I am sorry, the infrastructure is in place and they're responsible for setting all the standards. So the data standards, the reporting standards, technical standards, code of connection, design. We have FRC who recently changed their rules for calculations for ASTM 1, um, keeping dashboards in, in mind. Um, and that's where DC schemes will, will need to set the criteria to make sure they're returning the right calculations and a consistent calculation. We've got the FCA who are obviously setting um, corresponding rules to the regulations for their universe of, of personal and stakeholder um, pensions that they regulate. And the FCA are also responsible for regulating dashboards themselves. So the Money and Pension Service will provide a dashboard, but there will be other commercial dashboards that will also exist, and the FCA will be regulating those and setting a very high bar, I should add. Um, and TPR, of course, we will be um, regulating our own universe of occupational um, workplace pension schemes. Um, we've produced some really, really useful guidance um, and, and, and a checklist. Um, quite good read actually, if you're interested in it. Um, and also compliance and enforcement, we're, we're obviously responsible for that. And we've been consulting on our, on our policy um, recently. The main message here really though, is that most things are in place to enable schemes to understand what's required in terms of their duties. And as you can see from the slides, you know, all the delivery partners there are aligned and working together to deliver what's needed. It's been a lot of work. It's a significant project. Um, we are keeping savers at the heart of what we do to ensure that the outcome provides savers with the information that we that they expect to see, which is actually the crux of it, isn't it? So the dashboard available point or DAP, you might hear that referred to, is the point that the dashboard will be launched to the public. Now, that is still a way downstream, but it will be the point when, um, you know, the public will actually be able to see um, their, their schemes and the value there, but there is a lot for schemes and those supporting them to do in the meantime in terms of preparation. This is a very complex project. In February, government announced that more time is needed to deliver that digital architecture and as a result, the current de deadlines in legislation will be changing. Now, while DWP are currently looking to amend the connection deadlines, the overall regulatory framework will not change. You know, connection is an important part, but it's one piece of the dashboard's puzzle. So our key message is to urge schemes to continue with their preparations, in particular around data. The delays are an opportunity to get ahead of the game. I think it's fair to say that the original timings were quite ambitious um, for what is a hugely complicated project. So, what do we expect schemes to do? And this is a slide that, that I, I often talk to uh, with, with trustees, but I thought it was useful here. It highlights the four key calls to action that we're urging trustees to keep on top of. Firstly, find out what needs to be done. You know, our guidance is a really good starting point. It includes a handy downloadable checklist that schemes can add their own columns to and use to track their progress. And when I go along to scheme meetings, I see that replayed to us. While schemes will not yet know what their new connection deadline will be, what they can do is to make sure they've considered their options in terms of how they'll connect. So the route to connection, if you like, um, it's their duty to decide what works best for their scheme. We're encouraging schemes to include dashboards as an agenda item at their trustee and project boards to make sure re momentum remains and also to drive progress. And you know, our main message at the moment is for schemes to use this time to look at the data that's gonna be needed and not to leave it to the last minute and then get caught up in, in the rush. There's a lot to do to prepare. 
it's vital that schemes and those supporting them understand what needs to be done and put plans in place to take the action needed. So, you know, as I've said, connectability is clearly important, but it's data and the quality of that data that will ultimately determine the success of, of dashboards. And I guess while data and the accuracy of data is at the very heart of dashboards, it's not just a dashboard issue, it's the lifeblood of a scheme. It's not only needed to ensure the right person is being paid the right pension at the right time, but also for the smooth running of the scheme more generally. So what needs to be considered in terms of getting data dashboard ready? So let's just quickly look at matching up savers first and what's important here. As I've already touched on, the dashboard system will provide schemes with certain data, some of which will be verified by an identity service, so given name, date of birth, current address, and some data items which are self-asserted, so unverified information, such as national insurance number, previous address, previous last name, email address, mobile number, and so on. And more data is available in our guidance and on MAPS's website, um, if you'd like to find out more about those particular data items. Schemes need to decide which of those elements they will use to search their records for a match. Now that decision needs to be based on a scheme's confidence in their data. So while PASA, the, the administrator's industry body, has published some really useful guidance on matching conventions, it's important to stress that one size will not fit all. How schemes match dashboard requests to their data should be dependent on the quality of their data. So in simple terms, if a trustee is not confident in the quality of their national insurance numbers, they shouldn't use that to match. Schemes are actually going to need to define two sets of data. One for when they are confident of a full match, the happy path, if you like, and the other where they identify a possible match that need to confirm some of the detail. For, for example, they may have a bell rather than Angela Bell in their records, or the date of birth or national insurance number was one digit off or, or transposed. Now, in cases like that, a possible match would be returned and the user then, the saver, asked through the dashboard to make contact to confirm their details to achieve that level of confidence that's needed to confirm the match and then return the data. And in terms of uh, returning accurate information, once a member's been found, they'll be provided with that unique identifier which they can then use to retrieve the value data. Now, value data is basically how much pension they've built up to date and how much they are projected to have at retirement. Obviously that does depend on the benefit type and there's a handy table on our website where you can see some more information. So there are really four key steps um, for, for scheme managers and trustees to consider here. To understand what data will be received and what needs to be returned, to assess what that means for their scheme. So where are the key challenges likely to lie? to consider what data items they have more and less confidence in, in terms of setting the matching conventions, and perhaps most importantly, number four, what needs to be done to improve and maintain that data. It's my penultimate slide. And um, so the role of, of employers, you know, automatic enrollment has brought challenges, hasn't it? You know, there are multiple pots, there's transient workforce, and there's the degradation of data that that results from that, which is challenging for schemes. Dashboards are going to help with this, but partial matches are going to bring additional work for third party administrators, which are, who are already stretched um, and a less than ideal user experience. One of the things that we're asking employers to do is to encourage their staff to keep their personal details up to date with them and their scheme provider to make sure that savings don't get lost and go unclaimed. You know, active members there's a fairly direct route to their information, but once they have left that um, pension scheme, that employer, and become deferred members and then get married and then move, it becomes increasingly tricky. Um, savers often forget to update payroll and their pension schemes when their personal information changes. Um, personal email addresses rather than a work email addresses, for example, they're particularly useful for keeping in touch with savers, but there are you know, a few savers when they're, when they're, when they're um, automatically enrolling in, in, in a scheme with, with a new employer. You know, we do see a lot of work email addresses given there rather than personal information. And obviously once they leave, that work email no longer works. 
So you can play an important role here in terms of encouraging your employer clients to urge their staff to keep their personal details up to date. Um, otherwise that could you know, really quite easily lead to lost benefits. There's also a key role that employers and payroll, actually there's a key role for everyone involved in, in, in pensions um, to play ahead of the dashboard availability point. We're gonna get at least a six month um, in advance notice from the Secretary of State once we're at um, that dashboard availability point. And um, I expect that there will be a very strong communications campaign to support that. So I think that's a really key point that we would like to work together um, with you to, to, to get some key messages um, across through employers to savers, if that makes sense. Um, so my final slide, compliance and enforcement what happens if things don't go as we want um, so we've recently consulted on our compliance and enforcement approach um, we're currently going through the results our final policy of, is of course going to be dependent on how the legislation changes so we may need to rethink some of the specifics but that said our policy is as you would expect it's risk-based it's focused on member outcomes it aims to encourage compliance rather than to apply a simple punitive approach. Mandan mandatory penalties are not part of the regulations, which we are very pleased about. Any regulatory action we take will be targeted, it will be measured, it will be evidence-based, and we'll target our resources according to the level of risk and intervene only to the extent necessary to address the harm or reduce the risk. You know, our focus is very much on, on three things. Data quality, not just in finding members through matching, but also that the saver trusts the information that they get. Scheme governance, um, robust internal governance will obviously enable the scheme to identify issues and risks early and put in place those mitigations. And that, that all links to record keeping and audit trails, keeping a record of those key decisions that schemes make is really important. And third parties, you know, we acknowledge that schemes are gonna be highly dependent on third parties in order to comply. And we will consider using our powers where necessary. Um, and again, that's where keeping a record of those key decision points that schemes make are important. We recognize the challenges the industry are facing at the moment and we will be pragmatic and we will consider the circumstances of the breach but as the slide says and the, these words you'll probably recognize from our all trashy enrollment um cne policy you know where we see intentional non-compliance we will take a, a dim view um, i think is, is probably the best way to say so that is the end of your whistle stop tour <laughs> through the world of, of pensions dashboards that I could probably wibble on for, for, for much longer, but um, I'm, I'm really I'm keen to hear any questions that you have. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so that I can actually see you, if that's okay. Thank Thanks. you, Angela. Um, I've got a couple of comments. Um, Jennifer said so clearly explained, thank you. Joe, thank you so much for ta take, talking to us. This is a great scheme. <laughs> Um, Selena, really useful presentation. Thank you. And then another few more thank yous coming in. Um, I just want to ask, I did a redeclaration the other day for one of my clients. And on it, you have to put in the pension scheme. Now, when I was at Accountex, I've spoken to someone and I think I'm going to change the pension schemes for some of my clients, um, the ones that want to move. How soon do I need to tell the pensions regulator? Do I just do that on a redeclaration or do I do it mid-year? Um, I am not entirely sure. Carol, can you pin me that question in an email so that I don't yes. lose it in my head somewhere? And then I yep. can forward it probably to a name that you recognise, Andy Nichols. <laughs> <laughs> and yep. he will tell me the answer. I realise it's nothing to do with the presentation. I just sat here thinking, oh, I wonder if she knows. Yeah, no, no. Um, I know I work. I work with Andy, so, um, so can I, you know, I can, can I say something? Can I say something? Um, I'd rather you use the chat. Oh, sorry. Okay. If you could. You. No, it's fine. Do you want to put a question in the chat? No, this is regarding your questions. I've done in past. Uh, I've transferred uh, NAS pension to the different pension provider. Uh, it's just uh, it's just need to inform the pension provider. It's just a simple transfer 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 form. You need right. to 
something like that. So I've done in past. And then when you when you do declaration, uh, then you have to provide that new pension provider uh, reference number and everything there. That's how I've done uh, it. Right. All right, excellent. Thank you. I saw that there is a, a, a question in the in the chat about if I move house, will that be a yeah, partial I've, match? I've lost the chat now. <laughs> <laughs> I just grabbed, I'll just pick that one up. Yeah, I'm um, back. It depends on the matching criteria. You know, um, I think that, that Paz has um, suggested Hacky Path, if you like, is is um, surname, um, ad ad address, um, and, and date of birth. And because obviously those are the things that are verified. But if you if you as a pension scheme, you've got somebody's surname, you can match that and their first name. You can match that. You can match their date of birth. You can match their national insurance number. The fact that you've got um, a different current address, you might be able to see that the previous address matches. I, I think I would have confidence that I am able to find that person. But where I just have someone's national insurance number and nothing else matches or where I have um, a surname and a date of birth and nothing else matches. I, I would return that as a, as a partial match because I wouldn't have complete confidence that I would have the right person to give them the, the, the values. Um, and then I would ask them to contact um, their, the, the administrator to clarify and clean up those details. So it's a, it's a great opportunity for a data cleanse as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, Jane said, can we have the YouTube link, please? That was on the, one of the slides, wasn't it? Yes, are you sharing the slides or shall I pop that in the chat? Um, I'm assuming we'll be able to share them. Sam, is Sam there, Ali? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, that's fine, we can share them. I just said to, if you want to share the link and the presentation with me, Angela, I can also put that in the newsletter at the end of the month. Oh, okay, lovely, that'd be great. I've just put that link in the chat as well. All right, brilliant. I'll read it out in a minute. A few more questions coming through now as well. This is good. Yeah. Hilary, I think this scheme stroke app would be very useful for people who have left the UK being over 60 trying to find out about pensions is a nightmare. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so um, there's one, there's a couple of things I didn't say in that. So the first thing is um, pensions in payment are out of scope of this first kind of version of, of dashboards. So for people who are already drawing pensions, um, that pension would be out of scope. But if they're trying to look for pensions that they are not already drawing, then they are in scope, if that makes sense. The, um, the only thing that they would need to get through if they're overseas is the registration process for the verification, the identity verification. So long as they can get through that and they're able to prove their identity, um, they would be able to access that information. Right. And that that link is https double dot forward slash forward slash utu so y o u t u dot b e forward slash o two seven dash r dash capital e k m r eight for those no. that wanted it. Yeah, there is also. Thank you for that, Angela. I, I, don't yeah, know the link in the chat. I maybe should have given the link to PDP's website, which is where it sits. <laughs> I'll grab that in a second. Right. And on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much because I'm going to swiftly move over to Darren now, who hopefully is somewhere. I've lost you, Darren. I'm really sorry. I'm still here. Don't worry. Excellent. I'm still here. I'm also, can I just um, let you know, I, my colleague Harry is also joining us today. So if you see Harry Stenton on the participants, uh, Harry is our um, business specialist for accountants and bookkeepers. So he's joined us today. So thanks right. very much for Brilliant. having us. So this is Darren, everybody. And he's from Fathom, which is an IAB member benefit. And as a leader in the development of financial analysis software, Darren will be sharing insights on how the role of a financial professional even is evolving specifically in an advisory capacity. So good morning, Darren. <laughs> as everyone falls asleep now, as, as yeah. we go into this, this little nugget. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. So listen, I've got 10 minutes. I, I, there's no PowerPoint presentation. There's no slides. Um, there's a much further and deeper discussion that would that we'd love to have with you. Um, I think first and foremost, why has Fathom partnered with the IAB? One is we're, we're passionate about the role that bookkeepers play in supporting small business growth and success. And that's that's underpins what we do. Um, 
what I think is is so amazing is when I talk to bookies and accountants was 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 a great example of this. Um, I still hear when we have those conversations, people just use that phrase, and it may be familiar to you. I'm just a bookkeeper. Is that something that resonates with any of you? If that, it is, just to, just give me a, just give me a thumb <laughs> just give me a thumbs up if that's the case in the in the chat, um, or just try to type me out. But that's something I consistently hear, um, and actually I, I challenge that thinking. Uh, and what I believe in, and what what Fathom believes in, is that you know if if we switch that, then in a lot of cases you're actually the CFO of your client's businesses. You're the F financial controller. You're the FD of those businesses. You are so well-placed to provide the support and help that those businesses need right now. And again, if I ask a question of you, what is what are the three things, if, there, if there's three, or what's the most important thing that's on everyone's mind right now, um, given that the, the world is in a very peculiar place, you know, with inflation that's happening, we've got external events that are outside of our control. Um, we've got the, the 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 specter of late payments for a lot of your clients. You're sitting there trying to work with your clients to give them strategies, tactics to weather that. So I think there's no better person that's placed to deliver those services than you. And I I, I will commit to this is that I think advisory and the term advisory is 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 a cliche. It's overplayed. It's very broad. It doesn't necessarily convey to something that we're actually doing on a day to day basis. And what we're we're very keen on is saying, okay, let's let's change this. What if we substituted the word advisory with coaching, mentoring? How would you feel about providing those services to your clients right now? And that's, this is where we see a lot of bookkeepers switching that thought process into actually I'm a I'm an FD I'm a CFO with this client and I'm working with this client on a, a coaching basis and a mentoring basis to deliver these services it's not just about I'm I'm going to sound controversial my clients aren't buying a balance sheet if, if I can put it that way that's the way I think we need to look at this what are we providing we're providing all that knowledge that you've been training for you've qualified for and a best place to to to, to deliver that and this this goes across a range of issues so we already know for example that businesses 80 87% of businesses are getting paid late at the moment 59% of businesses want their accountants to deliver this but accountants have their head down in a lot of cases on compliance work and because it's safe and they're not as close and they don't have that 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 that's that close relationship that you have with your clients you're much more closer to them and much more embedded within those firms so i actually think there's a huge opportunity for you to do two things one is to grow your fee income and to protect that income as well as leverage that for your clients as well for better outcomes and a lot of this is is, is revolving around just simple things like coming up with a business plan doing a forecast that if you like this a trifecta a business plan a forecast and some regular cadence of accountability um, and that's essentially what we're seeing bookkeepers now evolve into so we're having those regular meetings we're setting those forecasts we're reforecasting on a regular basis we're digging into kpis we're taking the time to understand what makes those businesses run more effectively rather than looking backwards and historically we're actually looking forwards and looking at leading indicators and setting those in place with those clients so we can measure them and see the potential outcomes now the benefit of doing that is actually we can have more opportunities to course correct than we can at the end of the year or the end of a period so that's that's a much better way of doing it so that that's the reason why we wanted to get involved with the IAB because we see you as positioned extremely well but it does require a little bit of a shift in mindset personally and professionally I think we first of all have to think of ourselves as not just bookkeepers and that we can provide these 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 higher level services that clients so desperately want right now and they want more than ever because they want to sleep at night and you're in a, in a huge position to do that how do we do that through tools like ours? Um, and obviously, Harry's here to, to to discuss that, and we'll happily have conversations with you. So, but for us, it, it should start with a conversation. How can we embed this as a natural level of your service? And if you've got, you know, for us, twenty you percent know, of your client base 
um, I would reach out to them tomorrow and say, look, if I were providing you the services, is something that you would find valuable. Don't get caught up on how we price it. There's lots of tools and resources about how you can do that. The first thing we have to show is empathy and have that conversation with them. And I would pick 20% of my, my clients who I enjoy working with, that they're paying me a great fee, and I would offer that service to them. Without a shadow of a doubt, tomorrow I would get a report out to them. I would get a, a forecast done to them tomorrow and not just a forecast that looks at the next 30, 60, 90 days. I'm thinking 12, 18 months, two years down the line. What are your plans for hiring? Start to introduce some element of risk planning. Okay, what would happen if those plans, what new sales contracts have you got coming up? What new assets need to be purchased? Let's factor those in. Let's think of growth because the small business is where it's going to come from. That growth is going to come from the small business community. Factor those in, but also factor in scenarios. If all of those hiring plans, those asset purchases and um, sales contracts come in, great. Let's plan that as a best case scenario. But what happens if the world would suddenly take a little bit of a different turn? And what happens if COVID struck again and we have to dial everything back? What would the impact be? Help your clients see the impact of those decisions before they make them. And that's certainly something that we want to be able to help you with and deliver that service to you. And I think that's that's so important. Part of that is, is partnering with you. That's providing a platform that you can register for, you can get a free trial for, you can get a discount on that, but also about helping educate you on how to get the most from that platform, how to segment your clients, put the right clients on the platform so this becomes a naturally embedded service for you around coaching, mentoring, and advising. I'd hate to use the term advisor because it is so, so broad, but identify, you know, if there is a shortfall in capital, how can we help that client get better funding? If we need to look at how much people are paying into their pension pots, let's let's pick that up. I'm just picking up on the on the last speaker. Um, it's it's really useful. I mean, one of the questions I asked at Accountex and Daz last year was how many of, how many people are actually going back to their clients now, assuming that inflation's at ten percent. How many of you are actually? forecasting the impact if all your staff came to you and said i want a 10% increase in pay how could you fund that and it was shocking to see that no one was doing that so there can be external factors that we can take model and give our clients peace of mind so i would urge you to do that this isn't going to sort of teach you how to suck eggs but i think it, it, it demonstrates what we're seeing those more forward-thinking bookkeepers start to do for their clients that's really positioning them as the go-to people. And I think it is time that people started recognizing themselves as we're more than just bookkeepers. We are actually at the heart of what we do and we're seeing that play and the important role that you're playing. So if anything, it's a bit of validation. It's a bit of a rah-rah for the, for the profession and how we see that, that being done, um, but also how that, that is then translating into an impact that they're having from that client and how they're able to go out there and win new business so i'm coming up on a little bit of my time in terms of 10 minutes i'll, I'll happily open it up to some questions if there are any coming through there um i just want to go go back down before we go to questions because angela bell has put in another link for me to read out yeah i love links so this one is www.pensions-boardsprogram.org.uk forward slash so that was a nice, easy link. So, so if you love links, I'm <laughs> dropping one in there for you now as well. Oh, you're excellent. I love them. So then we've got a lot of um, thumbs up for your... Um, did I touch a nerve speaker. there? Did I touch yeah, a nerve you, where people you thought... You did with were... the bookkeeper, definitely resonates. Awesome. Yeah, I've got That's quite great. a few thumbs up for that. Um, and then we move on to my clients aren't buying a balance sheet. Totally agree with you. I love that from Rachel. Um, Jennifer says, I totally agree, Darren, we play such a huge part in all the, the tiny details of the transactions. We know where the numbers belong, so we're not forecast and advise on what is ahead, so valuable for our clients. And then I've got your link, your star. So it's www.fathomhq.com forward slash partners forward slash, is that IAB? Is forward it? slash IAB, and then on IAB. there you'll see a little bit of a reason why we partner with the IAB. There is a big green button around halfway down that says if you want to take out a free trial, which you can, 
um, click that button and you can get 20% off for your first 12 months. So there is that. Um, but absolutely, um, it is something that people talk about. People are sometimes afraid. Sometimes people think that it's great for small business. Uh, I think there's a comment there, Mark. This is great for small business. However, forecasting is management accounting. Um, I disagree. I think every business should have three things, a forecast, um, a, ballot, a, a business plan, and some form of ongoing accountability or meeting to reset to qualify what those those um, that client ultimately wants and how we can set them and, and it help them achieve that outcome. Um, I think people getting it, certainly when I was in practice, I saw a lot of small business owners, you know, not even understand what their break even point was. They didn't even understand how much to pay themselves on a monthly basis, um, whether they should take that as, you know, as a salary, as a dividend or, or what have you. Um, we've all seen people, we've all had clients walk to us in tears and crying their eyes out. Um, so, but I think that the, the key, the thing for us is really, um, you know, just have that conversation with your client, help them understand where the cash is going. So many people confuse a budget with a cash flow, and the two are very different. One is about spend control, the other is actually about when cash is going to come into my business and what we can do about that. So, absolutely, I think cash flows are for every business of every size. And it's something that we can do to really challenge their thinking on on what their strategy should be. And I think there's no better person place to do that than, than you. Yeah. Christine says, you're absolutely right, Darren. It's an elephant in the room discussion that nobody has really addressed. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, Mark, you've answered. Joe, thank you, Darren. Love this. Um, Christine, I've just received queries with the HMRC concerning my client Spain due to Brexit years ago. In Spain due to Brexit years ago. Yeah, Devon, thank you, Devon. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, Harry is is the go-to person who works with with our bookkeepers and accountants. Um, he's a great person. You can log on, um, reach out, drop me an email. You can connect with me on, on LinkedIn. You can connect with Harry on LinkedIn, Harry Senton. Um, I'd love to continue this conversation with you. Um, but also, you know, talk to some of our other members that are, that are doing it as well. Um, Jennifer, great to have you on board. And we, we look forward to working with you on that one. Jennifer's signed up at Accountex. So we look forward to helping Jennifer with that. But again, you know, if we can help anyone else, please do let us know. And a lot of it isn't just about the platform. It's about the, the education and the training that goes around that and the CPD that we, we do as well. Um, so I'm, we're, we're forever grateful for, for kind of working with you you guys as well. Uh, and hopefully you'll see some more more content coming through us through the magazine and, and the newsletter as well. So keep an eye out for that. But any questions, we're here to help. Thank you right. for your time this morning. Brilliant. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Darren. Um, I personally use your software as well. It's, it's really good. Uh, I agree with a lot of what you say. Well, totally. <laughs> I know we missed each other at Caltech, but we're probably still with there talking. <laughs> that was the case. <laughs> Um, I think part of um, the software that you have as well, it just really um, supports those com uh, those conversations with the clients as well. So not only have they, you've got the static reports, what I love is you've got that online. Um, so we, you can have a conversation with the client, especially on Zoom now, yes. uh, and play through lots of different scenarios. You know, if I increase my sales by 5%, this is, you know, this is how near I am to achieving my, you know, you, you know my goals. So a really fabulous piece of software, really interactive, not just that static. And it's absolutely where we need to be as quality bookkeepers going forward. Um, Darren, what's your thoughts, though, about how this keeps us ahead of the AI game that's coming along? So, um, so that's, a, that's a really good question. So I'm, I'm always great. I, th I think AI, I'm, I, first of all, I'm a geek. I'm a technology. I love technology. Um, I've seen the impact that that has had in terms of tools like zero and where we were 10 years ago uh in terms of you know we 10 years ago we weren't even thinking about automated bank feeds we weren't there weren't products like dext around 10 years ago um they were just starting to come in so i've seen what technology can do i think what we have to do is embrace that there are um, ways in which ai will help us get rid of a lot of the grunt work that we're doing the, the hard repetitive tasks but I still think what we're dealing with from it, I, I, I squinge when to say the advisory word, um, when we're dealing with the emotive, nothing will deliver that the way that a human needs to. If we're going to deliver good advice, if we need to deliver something that's a little bit more um, 
you know, we, we have to see, look into someone's eyes when we deliver this service. We need to see body language, you need to read people. And I think that's that's where people can do. And I think there's an element of doing less to do more and having more impact. And I think we've got to think of this in terms of impact and output as opposed to input. That's really where I see the, the role that AI will play. I mean, I've, I've really used... Um, it's just some examples. I think, you know, as, 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 a, as a marketing tool, I think AI is great. I've generated, and I'm happy to share a video with your, your members if you want this. I use ChatGP to generate 30 pieces of, of content around cash flow forecasting and dropping that into Canva really quickly. It's brilliant at that. And you can pop 30, you know, give me 20 questions that people are asking about KPIs right now, and you can generate content very quickly. It's going to struggle with the what I would call the emotional AI, and that's really where where bookkeepers who have that relationship with the, the client are going to generate and benefit from. So yes, it's here. Yes, it will evolve. I think we have to deal with it very cautiously, but I think if we adopt it in the right way, it should give us the opportunity to do less, but be more impactful. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Um, David's just put in the chat as well. AI will help us to become more effective consultants and focus on the needs of our clients. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Darren's put in a link for Harry Stenton as well. Yeah. So Harry dot Stenton at theaccessgroup.com if you want to reach yeah. out to Harry. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. If anyone's just just confused, thank you, Fabian, Darren. Fabian versus access, it, we were acquired by access uh, last September, so that's why the email addresses have changed. Ah, right. Appreciate okay. your time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Darren. So now we'll go over to Sarah for HMRC updates. Okay, um, I've, I've just got one small note actually from HMRC, and that is that from next Monday, the twenty second, HMRC will close the VAT registration helpline. So there won't be any telephone contact with that particular team. Um, their rationale is that they would rather deploy the staff to actually process the applications rather than answering calls about where has our application got to. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so if you've got any questions, I'd be on the phone this week because from next week it won't be available. Um, Hopefully, they if they're going to be processing them, we won't need to phone up to find out where they are. Exactly. So hopefully it's a good decision. Um, they are advising that there's a 40 day turnaround time. So don't contact them within that first 40 day period by email. That would be. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, so there you go. So that's um, just a practical matter with the HMRC as well. Um, I Rachel's about... been waiting three months for client VAT registration. Yeah, there is. There's a they are being slow at the minute, I have to say. Um, but anyway, I just want to touch on account text as well. So we were up at account text last Wednesday, Thursday. Absolutely incredible show. It gets bigger and better every year. Um, big shout out to all our members who came and found us on the stand. And thank you to all our ambassadors as well. It was really great to see you all, everyone, all our ambassadors, or most of our ambassadors came within an hour um, and gave an hour of their time to the stand as well to talk to anyone that was there. So super busy, really, really good, good couple of days. Obviously, Darren was there. We never got to talk to each other. <laughs> it's absolutely mental. Um, but I have to say, it's actually almost becoming a fintech show. There is a lot of new products on the market and there's some really fabulous uh, companies out there. But what I just, on reflection, I came away thinking, actually, when you're, running your own business, it's easy to be drawn away by the shiny magpie as well, you know, or that magpie syndrome. So um, when you're shopping around and having a look at the market, just be really clear about your business and what your business needs. So I'm very clear, you know, I'll have a proposal software, I need an accounting package, I need a management accounts, um, you know, there's specific things I need. And there can be quite a lot of overlap with some of the products that are out in the market so it does become harder to navigate so if you come from the place of what do I need rather than what does the software provide so you don't get drawn off track that would just be my thoughts on you know that overwhelm of what was going on um, um and just also to help with that just remember that any of our member benefits have gone through a rigorous internal process with the IAB so hopefully if you look at our member benefits we've probably done some of the legwork for you in deciding which apps um, we would recommend in the marketplace as well. 
it does but, get, can I just say it does get confusing when you're walking around a Countex because every stand says that you need them. Yes, exactly. If if you're not careful, there's there's three or four stands that do exactly the same thing. Mm. So yeah. And you, you end up with softwares that overlap in your business too. And it, so you just yeah. need to be really, really clear on what how you want your business to work and how those apps and you know that tech can actually aid your business rather than detract from your your pathway. Uh, but no, absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, I was actually asked to speak on one of the panels as well, which was brilliant fun. Um, so that was the topic there was about uh, how the rising tide. Um, gosh, Sam, what was it? I can't remember what it was now. <laughs> Sam, um, how the rising tide benefits everyone. So um, in essence, we weren't talking about boats; we we're talking about people. The um, and like how you're looking of, of teams, of clients, of um, of of. Of people that work for you basically just how it all fits together and, and, and the suppliers wasn't it suppliers that was right caroline yeah yeah have yeah. a team very yeah, informative <laughs> yeah so, i was know, listening yeah yeah i just see you there um but no it was, it was really good really good show really positive so we will definitely be there again next year but um yeah so thank you for everyone that attended and i would definitely recommend attending next year if we didn't manage to get there this year yeah, there is a Manchester one in September, which we are planning to be at as well. So for those that are more northern based, maybe you can uh, get to Manchester easily than you can get to London. So uh, yeah. what's the space? Yeah, I um, give my ambassador group the, the dates yesterday for next year in May and said to make a note of it and hopefully try and get there. Right. Yeah, no, it's definitely worthwhile. Um, and then my other just point is we've got our awards on the 20th of June and um, all the announcements for the finalists are going out across social media this week. So look out. Excellent. There, we've, we've Keep got our eyes peeled for them. Exactly. Um, in the chat, Jan said there's an eight week wait time minimum at the moment for VAT. Eva says, Harry, I like the access group. I attend up to two webinars um, organised by Access every month. And then Harry's replied to Eva to say, give me an email. David Taylor's put, lovely to see so many of you at Accountex. Uh, Darren, it's so easy to get lost in all of the tech. Uh, Joanna, thank you for this informative session. Have to leave due to load shedding in SA. Keep well. Uh, Jennifer, you can get software drunk. You certainly can, Jennifer. <laughs> Mark, I found Accountex to be like a Turkish bazaar at times. Yes, I got plenty of socks and pens. I didn't know the socks were a sort of thing. But Can I yeah. just say that's my favourite comment? Is it's like a Turkish bazaar. I think <laughs> exactly. that's brilliant. Turkish thank you, Mark. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. That's good. It's a long way from Scotland. Uh, Rachel, that must mean Manchester rather than London. Devon, thank you, Sarah. And Samantha. Joe, Sarah, please record the email for us to send comments on HMRC. Uh, okay, I'll put that. I'll, I'll ask Sam to put that in our newsletter at the end of the month. So have those contact details there. Yeah, and then hoping to make our way to Manchester. And then thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, thank so, you, everybody. That's the chat up to date. <laughs> so thank you to our speakers. I'll pass back to you, Caroline. Yes, thank you to Darren and Angela. Very informative morning. And our next coffee morning is the fourteenth of June again at 11 a.m. and hopefully we'll see you all then okay Brilliant. okay thank you very much thank see you all next month thank you. Bye. Thanks, bye. 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 bye bye bye